let's dive into it one time this morning. Uh, we are continuing along a path that we were last day. Last day we have been looking, in fact, over the last few weeks, we have been looking at the indwelling of Christ, Christ being in us, and, um, and we say that he's living in us through the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us an understanding uh, of the things to come. You all remember we spoke about that? That the Holy Spirit will give us an understanding of the things to come. And when we talk about the understanding of the things to come, it is not just getting, you know, super spiritual or spooky and uh, trying to figure out what's going to take place tomorrow or what's going to take place next month or, or when the everything is going to come to a culmination, but really and truly it's talking about the things to come in relation to our salvation, amen, and our eternal hope. So he opens the eyes of our understanding. He opens the eyes of our understanding. We, are, we actually come to that place of being spiritually enlightened. So he brings spiritual enlightenment to us so that we can understand what it is that um, is necessary for our salvation and for our eternal hope. Uh, we recognize that uh, a couple of weeks ago, in fact last day, we touched on it as well, that we may know the hope of our calling. These are the things that we see that he is going to bring to us. When we talk about him bringing to us or letting us know the things to come, there were some specific things, three specific items that we identified. One, that we may know the hope of his calling, that we may know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and that we and that we may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are the three aspects that we have been looking at in terms of what we're going to know. And we spent a little time talking about the power. And last day, we actually spent some time talking about this, that third element, knowing the power. Knowing the what? the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised Christ from the dead, when he raised him from the dead. And we said that the power that is at work in us is specifically mentioned here as resurrection power. The power really is in relation to that which had been released to raise Christ from the dead. And this gives us victory over, uh, over the flesh and the sin, and it gives us empowerment. It gives us victory to be able to endure. So the resurrection power displays the power of Christ, of God in Christ Jesus. We said also that our lives are to be conformed to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. So that in order for us to really experience the resurrection power, there's a process that needs to take place in that we need to be dead. Amen? We need to be crucified. Paul's testimony was, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. So that we recognize that the work that God is doing or the power being released in us is a resurrection power that we can be crucified with Christ, but we can live still based on the empowerment of Christ Jesus through his Holy Spirit. We also said that the message that actually uh, speaks about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, we call it the gospel. It's a good news. And we said that the good news, this gospel message, is the power of God unto salvation. Amen? So that, to, uh, so that we receive this information, we understand a little bit more about the power of God and us being brought into salvation based on the message that has been proclaimed. Christ himself proclaimed it and his disciples and apostles came to proclaim this message as well. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 to 20, we looked at that. In fact, let me just pick it up from, uh, yeah, from 17. That, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us 
who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him on the right hand in heavenly places. So this is where we were at over the last couple of weeks. And we want to continue this morning looking at, still focused on that, that third segment, which is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, so that we who believe have been experiencing the exceeding greatness of his power, which he wrought in Christ, his mighty power, this working of his mighty power that he uh, wrought in Christ um, when he raised him from the dead. So today, our focus is on looking at the power of God that brings us unto life and godliness, because the power is at work. We have the Spirit of God working in us, bringing a power, empowering us. And now we're going to see that the empowerment is to bring us into a particular place of understanding and bringing us into life and godliness. Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 to 4. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine nature, sorry, according as his divine power, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these he might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And um, a very important passage of scripture here that gives us an understanding of the power of God being applied to our lives. Being what? Applied, applied to our lives. So he says here in verse 3, according as his divine power, his what? His divine power. So according as the power of God hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So it's the divine power speaks about the power of God. So the power of God has given us something. So he says according as... Now, he introduces it with this, this, um, this praise and this glory, this, this salutation of praise. Grace and peace be multiplied unto God through our knowledge of, our, of God and the, the Lord Jesus. According as. And that word according as, you, you can, trans, some translations may say, seeing that. Seeing that his divine power. So it's based on this. His divine power has given us all things. And the all things really is all things that are necessary. All that is needed. All that may be needed in relation to what? Life and godliness. Life here is twofold. One spiritual life and secondly eternal life. So all things that are pertaining to the spiritual life, our earthly existence in the spiritual realm, so that we are living in this earthly life as spiritual beings, as individuals. Now I'm going to show you why that is an important emphasis. Because many times when people think about us receiving all things that pertains to life, we think about the carnal things that are delivered to us in life. That's not what Peter is speaking about here. We know you need your house, you need your car, you need your job, you need all those things. We know that's important and relevant to you at this time. But that's not what Peter is referring to here. He's referring to spiritual aspects and spiritual things. That's what his focus is on. According as the divine power, God in his power has given you all things that pertains to your spiritual existence, your spiritual life. Everything that is pertinent to you living a spiritual, spirit-focused, God-centered life has already been delivered to you. Every single thing that you need to make sure that you walk in alignment with God's will, His plan, His purpose for your life is already delivered to you. So He's saying He has given according as His power. How did we receive it? His power has been released to us. 
The Holy Spirit is the power of God that is at work in you. That has now revealed unto us all things. Not some things. All things that pertains to life. And not only life, uh, we said spiritual life, that's our spiritual existence here on earth as we work out our salvation. And secondly, the eternal hope that we have. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? Everlasting life. So that everything that has been, uh, that is necessary Everything that is needed for us to have everlasting life has been delivered to us. Jesus. That's good news. That our spiritual existence and our eternal existence has already been provided for and we have been granted the privilege to know that. All things according as his divine power, according to his divine power, hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What is godliness? Godliness is a term that you have seen from time to time throughout the scriptures, and it's an important perspective that we need to have because we are asked to live this life of godliness. Not so? And when you look at the term, the original Greek word that is translated godliness... It literally means well worship. Two words, uh, it's a compound word. One is well, and the other is worship. So it really gives you the understanding as it pertains to us living a life in right worship to God. Well worship. So it's about piety or devotion characterized by a Godward attitude. Doing that which is pleasing to God. Life that is in conformity to the knowledge of God, the true and the living God. So that we are living our lives in conformity. Not to the things of the world, but in conformity to the knowledge. Our confession of Christ Jesus, we are living based on that knowledge. That's what godliness is. Godliness is not just an empty religious term. It's about an active involvement in that which we know God has called us to be. So he's saying here now, everything that relates to life and godliness has been granted to us. According as his divine power hath given us. That term given is granted. So he has granted us everything that pertains to life. And godliness. And I think that's a great, a great declaration, a great affirmation that we can make in our lives that we have already been granted everything that pertains to life and godliness. But he didn't leave it there. He gives us an understanding further as to how this has been granted. So he says, according as his divine nature had, has given us or has granted unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, all things that pertain to our spiritual life, our eternal hope, as well as us walking in conformity to God's will, his plan, his purpose for our lives, all things concerning to that has been granted to us through the knowledge of him who hath called us. Through what? So that it is not that we're going to get this through osmosis. <laughs> it comes through what? Knowledge. Knowledge of whom? Of the person of Christ Jesus. It comes now through the knowledge of Almighty God. Through the knowledge of him that called us unto glory and virtue. So that we are able now to be empowered. The power of God comes through the knowledge of God. You didn't get that. The Spirit of God is bringing us to know God. And that knowledge that we have of God is what gives us the enablement or the empowerment to live this life spiritually in the way that God desires for us to live. You see, when the Spirit of God comes into us, He reveals, remember what He says? The Spirit of truth. 
and he guides us into what? All truth. And he brings us into knowing what Christ has taught us. And he brings us into knowing to, to be able to recall those things that he has taught us. You see, brothers and sisters, what he does is that he teaches us. He enables us to know God. When Christ walked the face of this earth, that was his intent. Go, to us, go with me to that high priestly prayer in, um, in John chapter 17, verse 3. And verse 1 tells us, Father, um, glory, uh, the hour is come, glorify thy son, that thy son may also glorify thee. Uh, verse 2, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Verse 3, read verse 3 for me. And this is, and this is life eternal, that they may... So Jesus is saying this, that life eternal is this. What is it? That they may what? Know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So what we want to be able to do is to come in that accurate knowledge of God in order to walk in the power of God. We got to know God. <laughs> You see, what we have seen in our lives, brothers and sisters, a lot of people know religion, but they don't know God. A lot of people know philosophy, but they don't know God. A lot of people know all types of things. You may know pastor, but you don't know God. And that's not what God wants. He wants us to know him. He is the true and the living God. He wants us to know the person of Christ Jesus. He wants us to come into that knowledge of him. And that knowledge talks about being intimate with him, being able to understand who he is and what he is doing. What's his plan for salvation? we got to know that. And if you get what I'm saying to us, because brothers and sisters, for too long we have seen people come into church and they are still foreigners with God. They're still enemies. They're still aliens. And we have to come to that place of being able to know him. Because if we don't have that knowledge of him, he's going to reject us saying, I never knew you. You see, a lot of people want to see power. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, 21. Not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I what? I never knew you. <laughs> Depart from me, ye that work it iniquity. You see, brothers and sisters, that intimate knowledge of God is essential for us. So the display of the power that we want to see is not just in the signs and wonders. It's not just in the casting out of devils. It's not just in the prophesying. It's in our knowledge to with the true and the living God. That's what gives us the enablement so that we can now stand. Yes, we are not saying to don't lay hands on the sick. Either. Go ahead and lay hands on the sick. That's, that's a demonstration of the power. But you can do all of that and still miss it. You understand? Jesus, he says that. This scripture shook me up, you know. And that's really and truly a word that brought me into salvation. Because you could be going to church for years. According to the old people, you could be going to church for donkey years and still miss it. Because you don't know one thing about what it takes to enter into salvation. When we talk about the power of God, we are talking about the ability of the Holy Spirit working on the inside of you to bring the change that is necessary. The power of God, when Christ died on the cross, the main purpose for his death on the cross is so that you and I could be saved. That's the main purpose. 
There are other ancillary purposes. There are other ancillary benefits. But the main thing is the redemption of mankind. That man has been redeemed from their sins. And as a result of that knowledge, brothers and sisters, we repent of our sins to come in alignment with the will of God for me to come to, to enter into salvation. Look what he says. Go back to Ephesians. Uh, sorry, to Second Peter. Go back to Second Peter. He says, here, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that what? That hath called us. Last day I spoke about election and I said, brothers and sisters, that we need to understand that a critical element or a critical understanding of salvation is that we have been elected to enter into the kingdom of God. You have been selected, you have been called by God to enter into the kingdom of God. And we have to respond to that calling. And as we respond, the Holy Spirit now works with us to be able to get to know God get to know Christ. Why? Because there's an indwelling of the Spirit of God to bring you into that readiness for God. Knowledge. There's an old saying, knowledge is power. <laughs> and what we want to be able to do is to come into that right knowledge of God. And that comes as a result of the Spirit of God, that power of God on the inside of us revealing to us. Look what he says, whereby are given unto us exceeding and great promise and precious promises. What he says, whereby are given unto ex exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the what? What are the promises that were made? What are the exceeding great? What promise that God can make to us that can be qualified as exceeding great and precious promises? That promise towards eternal life. That's the exceeding great and promise. Uh, that, that, that promise. That promise of that future glorification. That our body is going to be changed. That this mortal is going to put on immortality. This corruptible, when we talk about corruptible, we're not talking about government. Right? We're talking about the ability, this decayable. This body that can die and decay. So he says that this corruptible shall put on incorruption. So which means when your body is changed, when this transformation takes place, you are no longer mortal, you become immortal. So this mortality will put on immortality. That's what we are looking towards. That's a great and exceeding great and precious promise. And what we have been focusing on is some other minor promises. In fact, um, from next month, we're going to be giving you all a series of different promises that God has made in his, in his word for us through the person of Christ Jesus that we're going to be able to benefit from. But this eternal promise, this is what he's looking towards. This great and precious, these great and precious promises. And how do we identify what are the great and precious promises? Look what he says here. Through, uh, sorry, the, whereby are given unto us great, exceeding great and precious promises. That by what? But that by these he might be what? Partakers of the? So what? promise you have that can bring forth the divine nature in you. The promise to have a big shoes, a nice shoes. The promise to get a, a nice car. The promise to get a big house. How does that affect the divine nature in you? The promise of the Spirit of God coming to dwell on the inside of you, that affects the divine nature. All of you understand what I'm saying? So that our focus has been shifted so much, brothers and sisters, within these modern times that we have not been able to understand the focus of God's word. And we have allowed ourselves to stray away into a place of carnality instead of maintaining our focus on spirituality. So the divine promises that he's talking about here, all of this that he's talking about here in terms of the power and the divine promises and the divine power and the knowledge is to bring us to that place whereby the divine nature will have an impact upon our lives. 
Jesus. Look what he says. That we may be partakers of the divine nature. Having ex escaped <laughs> the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's a powerful... I don't know if... <laughs> So which means God, the power that has been released to us is bringing us to a place, brothers and sisters, whereby the nature of God will come alive on the inside of us and that we will have the strength and the ability, not in our own selves, not in our own power, not in our own nature, but we're going to have the strength and the ability to escape the corruption that is in this world. Even though you're living in the world, you don't have to be affected by the world in such, a, in such a way. That we are here, brothers and sisters, but even though we are here, we have escaped. <laughs> this corruption that is in, this, this what we are seeing, brothers and sisters, that is in the world, came from a long time, a long place. Our old nature, for some of us, our old nature is still alive. And the reason for that is because we have not come to that knowledge. And in fact, if we have come to the knowledge, for some of us, we have rejected the knowledge. So that the change is necessary. The old nature, that, uh, that old nature has to change. You know why it's absolutely necessary? Because the old nature is incapable of relating to God. So this is why it is necessary now for us to have the divine nature coming. Look at it. What happened to man? Man sinned. Why? Adam sinned. Why? Because of the fact he was deceived by the enemy. And what had happened after Adam sinned is that man inherited a sin nature. And even though God ministered to man over the years, we had Abraham, we had Isaac, we had Jacob, we had Moses, we had all the prophets coming through, and God was able to minister to them, there was something that was missing. The internal man was not yet changed. Because Christ had not yet come, and, even, uh, and the Holy Spirit had not yet come to indwell man. The Holy Spirit was always our wrong, but what he would have done is that he would have ministered, he would have come upon man for a period of time. But it is only with the coming of Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, and the release of the Holy Spirit to come and dwell inside of man makes the difference. That the internal man can now be affected by the presence of God. That God can now come into an individual's life and bring change from the inside out. All the time, the Holy Spirit would have come upon them. So the effect was from the outside in. So like, for example, uh, in the book of Exodus, talk about a guy by the name of Beziel, who the Holy Spirit came upon him and he was able to do craftsmanship. He was able to make the things for, for the tabernacle. You saw the... Uh, the Spirit of God would have come upon the prophets and they would have prophesied and they would have done, but then he lipped it off. And what we are saying now is with the coming of the Holy Spirit, after Christ died, there's an internal presence that brings us into an understanding, brothers and sisters, that is different. That he now dwells on the inside of us. You see, what Christ did on Calvary is what makes this happen for us now. What did Christ do on Calvary? On Calvary, Christ destroyed the power of sin and death. That's what he did on Calvary. He destroyed the power of sin and death. So that when we now have the spirit of Christ on the inside of us, we have the power against sin and death. And this is why, this is why Christ says is that when you are in Christ, you never die. So that if we remain in Christ and we die physically, it's just a transition from life unto eternal life. So that we don't, hope, we don't have a, 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 we don't sorrow like those who have no hope. When you die, you ain't done. When you die, you now start. <laughs> I wonder if you get what I'm saying to us. So that what we realize, brothers and sisters, is that there's a greater hope. There's a greater promise. And this greater promise is what we live in. But the challenge is this. The old man. 
And when I talk about the old man, I ain't talking about if you have a husband over six years. Eh? We're talking about the old you, the old woman, the old Kent, the old Rennie, the old Anal, the old Mauricia, the old Dexter. <laughs> I wonder if you understand what I'm saying to us. The old us, that's where we had the problem. And if we continue to maintain that old man, our relationship with God is severely affected. Because the scriptures declare that the old man cannot relate to God. Look what Romans chapter 15, sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Read it for me, please. So in Adam, in Adam, all died. So every man who came onto the face of this earth after Adam was born dead, spiritually. All died in Adam. <laughs> Even so, he's given a comparison. Just as how we can understand that in Adam, all died. The opposite is true. In Christ, all shall be made alive. Amen. Now, there's a certainty that in Adam, all died. You understand that? There's a certainty that in Adam, all died. In a similar way, there's a certainty that once we are in Christ, we shall be made alive. All who are in Christ shall be made alive. And that's something that we need to be able to hold on to. Now, if we continue only in Adam, which is in our natural state, our destiny is death. However, if we can shift and move from that place of being in Adam to now being in Christ, then we can have life. That's what God is bringing us to. So he's, he has given us the knowledge to transit from being in Adam, which is the carnal man, to being in Christ, which is the spiritual man. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And look at verse 5. Remember I said earlier that the scriptures tells us that if we remain carnal, we cannot please God. Look what he says here in Romans. For they that are after the flesh do what? Mind the things of the flesh. So which means our mindset is carnal if we are only in the flesh. So if we are in Adam only, that's flesh. And this is why Jesus says you must be what? Born again. He that is born of flesh is flesh. He that is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I say unto you, you must be born again. So the old man is Adam. The new man is Christ. We were in Adam as flesh. That, that which was flesh came first, but that which was spirit came after. So we were in Adam. And as a person in Adam, as a man in Adam, I was a sinful man. But now that I come into Christ, there has to be change. Amen? Look what he says here. We know that to be, uh, that they that are after the flesh or in the flesh, their mindset are only on things of the flesh. But they that are of the spirit, the things of the spirit. So our mindset, look what he says. To be carnally minded is what? Why? Because we are still in Adam. So to be carnally minded is death. But to be what? Spiritually minded is life and... You know how much people want peace in their life? <laughs> so in order for us to live this life and to be able to understand what it means to have life and godliness, because that peace talks about being in right standing with God, right? Romans 5, now that we have been made right with God. We have been redeemed, so we have been brought into that right standing with God. We have peace with God. So you can only have peace when you're in right standing with God. 
I told you all some time ago this thing about rest in peace. If you ain't living in peace, you ain't gonna rest in peace. <laughs> you understand? So you gotta be prepared now. May he rest in eternal peace. Or may he rest in perpetual peace. Amen. If you're living in peace, you know. It comes, so if we are spiritually minded, we have life and peace. But if you are carnally minded, you have death. Verse 7. He tells you why. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. You understand that? So that the carnal mind, the man who is under that carnal way of thinking, one, he's not subject. He doesn't come in submission to God. In fact, what the scriptures, what Paul is saying is this. He cannot be. There's a rejection of the things of God. He just cannot be in subjection to the things of God. He rejects it. <laughs> You understand? We have to adopt a different mindset in order for us to come to that place of being at peace with God. Look what he says in verse 8. So then they that are in the flesh can please God. What does it say? So then they that are in the flesh cannot Please, God. So when we look at what Peter is telling us about us coming into this knowledge, we have to know what it means to really walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Because if it is that we want to please God, we have to be able to move and transit from a carnal life to a spiritual life. And this whole thing about teaching people to continue to live your life however you want, and yes, you're going to make it this cheap grace that is being taught to some people, it don't work like that. You understand? It don't work. I am quite certain that many people are getting set up. There's a setup. Because there's a need for us to recognize, brothers and sisters, to be carnally minded is death. <laughs> and when we talk about death here, it's not just physical death. You're going to die physically. Everybody's going to die physically. But we're talking about eternal spiritual death and eternal death. So you see here, the carnal, the fleshly mindset versus the spiritual mindset, the mindset of the spirit. The Holy Spirit works on changing the mind. That's what we want to be able to work on. Right? Hold that scripture in Romans. Let's just glance back at, at Peter here. Look what Peter says. According as his divine nature, his divine power hath given us what? All things. So that what he has given us is the spirit of God has been given to us to help us to understand what life and godliness is. The Holy Spirit has been given to usher us into this knowledge as to what life and godliness is about. This is the divine nature that has been deposited within us. This is, remember, the Spirit of God is God. And He now dwells on the inside of you. So the nature of God is in you through the person of the Holy Spirit. And He's now changing your nature to become in conformity to Him. Wow. Go back up to Romans chapter 8. And take it from the beginning now. So we saw that he said that to be carnally minded is death, right? But to be spiritually minded is life. Let's see the context in which this is actually presented. He says, therefore, there is therefore now, there is therefore when? No condemnation to them which are who? Where? In Christ. Not in Adam. So if we remain in Adam, we cannot hold this promise that there is therefore now no condemnation to me. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law, for the what? Law of the spirit of life, for the law of... 
the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from what? The law of sin and death. So what we realize, brothers and sisters, is that there's a new law at work on the inside of me. I am now no longer condemned because I am in Christ Jesus. I have come to the knowledge, the saving knowledge, the saving grace of Christ Jesus. And as a result of that new knowledge, as a result of that shift, I am no longer condemned. I am redeemed. I have been made righteous. I have been justified. Why? Because I have come into the saving grace of, of Christ Jesus. I have accepted the gospel message that Christ died for my sins. He was buried and he rose again. I just repented of my sin and I believed the gospel. Isn't that what Jesus says? Repent of your sins and believe the gospel. That's what brings us in. And now that I'm in Christ Jesus, we walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ. And I want to show you this. Hath made me free from the what? What is the law of sin and death? The law of sin and death is the power of sin and death that is at work in man who was still in Adam. That power of sin that influence that sin still has on an individual's life, that law. When you read um, Romans chapter, chapter 7 and you look at how Paul introduced, because Romans chapter 8 is a continuation of Romans chapter 7. And in Romans chapter 7, you saw that Paul was lamenting about this, what he's seeing. He's seeing a new law at work on him. He's trying to do right, but then he's finding that there's, a, there's something wrong. That even though I am making an effort to do right, there's something wrong. I wonder if how many people could testify about that. There's something, something wrong. <laughs> so he says here in verse 22, um, chapter 7, verse 22, uh, 21, I find then a law that, is, that, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. That's what it is. The law of sin and death is that power of sin over our lives. And once we continue to submit to that law, that power, it leads to death. So we had to break free. And he tells us how. So come down to verse, chapter, um, chapter 8 again. Verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in whom? So in order for us to break free from that power of sin, we have to be able to accept what Christ has done. Look what he says. For the law of the, the, of the spirit of Christ uh, hath made me free from the law or free from the power power of sin and death. Why? Because there's a greater power at work. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There's something greater. What Christ did on Calvary came to destroy the works of the devil. So that the power that was once there holding you bound, that power that kept you, that had you in, 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 in chains and had you down, that every minute you have to go after this one or go after that thing or go up. that power is broken in Christ Jesus. So what we have to do now is appropriate this now to our lives. And understand this. Look what he says. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So now we have to understand that the power of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is now at work in me. Amen. That's what it's about. And look why. Verse 3. Everything is right here. Look what he says. For what the law, now he's talking about the next law now, the, the, the law of, of Moses. Look what he says. For the law, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. So that we had the law. The children of Israel had the law. But the law was weak. Why? Because it required the flesh of man for its fulfillment. And man wasn't capable so it required now me 
as a human being to submit to this based on my own strength and my own ability and my own reasoning and my own judgment and my own. So when you see these laws, not only the Ten Commandments, you had 613 laws that you had to now align yourself with. But humanity was frail, and we had to, and we failed. That's why the law didn't work, because it depended on man. But now we're in a different system that depends not on man, but on Christ. So that he now comes on the inside of us. And this is why Peter spoke about the divine nature. You see, the issue here, brothers and sisters, is what can we use to overcome the power of darkness? Man has failed every time he tried to overcome the enemy. Every single time. From the Garden of Eden right down to the end. Every time he tried in his own strength. You all remember Samson? Samson had his strength and he had whatever and things like that. And when he get up, he bust rope and he pulled on pillars. That was his strength. The Spirit of God had come upon him um, to do that. But when he depended on his own strength, he realized in his own strength there is nothing. The scripture says that Samson got up and he wished not that the Spirit of God had left him. He did not know. He shook himself like he was doing all, of, all the time. And he did not know that the Spirit of God left him. Without the Spirit of God, brothers and sisters, we are nothing. We have no enemy. The first thing he comes and pucks out your eye. I wonder if you understand what I'm saying to us. So what we had, brothers and sisters, the natural man, we cannot in our own strength obey the laws. We cannot in our own ability our mind and our heart is so corrupt as human beings, we don't even want to. And for those of us who want to, we find it a struggle. And the only way that it can happen, brothers and sisters, is if we stop fighting and we surrender to the Holy Spirit. He says that there is a new law and the law of spirit. Look what he says. For the law, for the law, verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. The flesh is what made the law weak. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Look what it says here. Be very careful to look and see what happens here. God sent his own son how? In the likeness of, uh, of sinful flesh. So that Jesus did not come in sinful flesh. I wonder if you understand that. In the likeness. So he came like a man. So it means that he was not always a man. Jesus. So God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So the son of God existed before he came in the flesh. That's the point I want to make to you. That the Son of God existed before this, what we refer to as the incarnation. When Christ came in the flesh, that was not the starting point. That was not the genesis of the Son of God. So God sent in his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin did what? Condemned sin in the flesh. I like this word because he tells me I am not condemned, but sin is condemned. That which condemned me in the past is what God is now, through Christ Jesus, is condemning. Somebody didn't get that. So what we are seeing here, brothers and sisters, is this. That the righteousness now of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You see why Paul, um, Peter is saying that he gave us all things? That pertains to life and godliness so that we can now walk right with God because we have the Spirit of God who's at work on the inside of us, bringing out the fulfillment inside of us of what Christ has done. The work that Christ has done is now being fulfilled in us. We now can have it applied to our lives based on us having the Spirit of God at work in us. So it's not just about us working and trying out everything on our own. Because <laughs> in our own strength, brothers and sisters, we are nothing. So what we have here is that God has revealed himself unto us through the person of Christ Jesus. And we are able to break free from all the strongholds that the enemy has upon our lives. 
And then we go into verse 5 that says, for they that are after the flesh. And we, that's where we, we actually started earlier on to talk about our mindset. So now coming to this knowledge of what God has done through Christ Jesus and in the person of, 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 of the Spirit of God, we now are able to accept a change in the way we're thinking. Because of the fact that all the time we were thinking that we were defeated, all the time we were thinking that we have no option, all the time we were thinking that, uh, that we have no, no ability to fight this off, or we have no, uh, but what we realize now is that based on what God is saying, it's not in our own strength, it's not in our own ability, but it's on the Holy Spirit. He coming into us, us walking in Christ, us living in Christ. Go down to verse 8 and 9, let's, and we're going to wrap it up here. Look what he says here. Um, we read verse 8 earlier, but let's read it again. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Look what verse 9 says. But you are in the flesh, correct? You are? You are? You are? You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God, what? Dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of God, he is none of his. So we must have that divine nature on the inside of us. The Spirit of God must be dwelling on the inside of us. And He is who brings the change. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So you are in the Spirit if the Spirit of God is abiding on the inside of you. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't walk in the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is not resident in your lives... How do you get the Holy Spirit? You accept Jesus Christ in your personal life. You have him, because that's what he says. And you make a commitment to live for him, guess what? He says in his word, he will pray the Father to send the Holy Spirit for you. Once you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, in fact, in order to be born again, you have to be born of the Spirit of God. You must have the Spirit of God. So you enter into the relationship based on your confession. You receive the Holy Spirit. He brings you into actually walk and to live this life, right, in Christ Jesus. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth where? in you, so that we are no longer debtors to the flesh, right? Us, our life is no longer based on this fleshly kind of life. We have to live a life of the Spirit. And next day, we're going to be picking it up to you, with you, and we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5, where we're going to see the difference as to how we can bring this out in terms of seeing the power of God at work to further break that stronghold of walking in the flesh and to be able to walk in the spirit. So in Galatians chapter 5, let me just give you a, a, a tease at it. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. Let me um, look at that, that particular passage as we, as we just get a tease because we're going to start there um, next day. Look what he says here. This I say then unto you, walk in the spirit and you shall not what? And that's what Peter spoke about, that we've been escaped from. And that's what he says, the, the corruption that is in the world through lust. And now he's saying to us, if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill that lust. So the power that God has released unto us is breaking, breaking those shackles that have been upon our lives that was causing us to be separated from God. So when we walk in the spirit now, we will not fulfill those lusts that is in the flesh. We will not. In order for us to continue to walk in a carnal life, we, we have to abandon the spirit. You understand? So the essence of our spirituality, the essence of our walk with God in terms of our righteous stand with God has to be a spiritual walk, a spiritual life. If there's no spirit in our lives, we have no life. We're dead like a doornail. <laughs> you understand? So what we have been looking at is this aspect of us being able to walk, to be able to have the fulfillment. What Peter spoke about in terms of the power of God being released upon our lives, the divine power bringing us into a place where we can walk in the Spirit of God, where we can ex experience the nature of God on the inside of us and that we can be free. The Spirit of God is necessary for us. If we don't have the Spirit of God, we will be condemned. If we are still under the carnal 
Adamic nature, we are going to be condemned. We're going to die and go to hell. <laughs> we have to come out from that and live a life, be truly born again, be truly saved, and allow the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to be uh, at work in us so that we can indeed stand as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen?